aren't you going to review my podcast? I have reviewed it. Well, tell me then. I said I'd review it. I did not agree to tell you my review. You son of a bitch. <laughs> you'll see. It better you'll have see been it. five stars. It's going to be one star. You'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> five stars only, also. Please. <laughs> Please. Welcome to Gam Jabbar, your guide to the iconic world of Dune. We'll be exploring the themes, philosophies, and characters found in the sandy depths of this vast universe, from Frank Herbert's groundbreaking novels to the adaptations on film and TV. My name's Abu. My name is Leo. And Leo. Yeah. We told our listeners that we would do a book club episode. <laughs> yeah. But we didn't tell them we'd let them listen to it. Yeah, we didn't say we'd publish it. God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, semantics preacher. I can't wait to talk about that today. <laughs> yeah. What a troll. Welcome back, folks, to the Children of Dune book club series. Y'all know the drill. We are diving into the pages of this iconic book, 50 pages at a time, every episode. And we are so delighted to have you on this journey with us. Indeed. Now, some housekeeping. As always, these episodes are spoiler-free. We will not be discussing anything past the pages of today's reading, no matter how tempting it is. Uh, <laughs> we will wait and be patient for you, dear listener, for you. That's right. And look, these book club episodes are a lot of work. So the best way to support the show and help us continue to do what we do best is to become a patron at patreon.com slash gamjabar. Not only will you be supporting the show, you'll get cool benefits like completely ad-free episodes, weekly bloopers and cut clips, and an invite to our exclusive Discord server where you'll get to chat with me and Leo directly and get to know all of the geeky members of our little community. Yeah. Of course, we have to. Give our appreciation to our Quisats Hatterack level members, Case Aiken, Nate Hyde. So fun to say your names every every episode. <laughs> Fellas, I'd fly you all the way to my planet to uh, tell you about how much I like you. <laughs> <laughs> now, another excellent way to support us on the show is to check out our incredible Dune merch on GamjabarShop.com. Folks, you can look good, you can feel good, and you can fuck like demons in amazing <laughs> products like our Walk Without Rhythm socks or our Kwisatz Haderach tank tops. Are you, are you suggesting that they have sex while wearing socks? <laughs> <laughs> look, everything on our storefront is a sex object. <laughs> I speak no lies. We have our Muadib sex tote. We have our... <laughs> Dune Use your imaginations. Sex glass. <laughs> 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 Moving on from that before that gets way too R rated. Somehow. <laughs> <laughs> we love to hear from you folks. So write to us. Email us any and all questions or observations or silly jokes that you may have as you read this book along with us. Gamjabar podcast at gmail.com. You know that email. A reminder, actually, that our next episode is going to be a full-on mailbag. So now is the time to hit send on that email. Indeed. All right. With housekeeping out of the way, we're going to start today's episode with a summary of the reading, as we always do. Then we're going to dive into a couple of key takeaways. And then finally, we're going to wrap up with uh, a healthy daily recommended dose of... Uh, Spicy, spiced morsels. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. So let's take a short break, but don't go anywhere, folks, because when we come back, we are diving into today's reading. These are some of the densest chapters we've covered thus far. You're not going to want to miss it. Welcome back, everybody. 
Hope you had a good break. Let's get into it. Let's talk about chapter 13. So chapter 13 begins with Leto and Kinema as they are sitting in one of their private places in the siege, looking out over the sunset. And they're here, Leo, because Leto has convinced his sister that they must do something very, very dangerous. They got to communicate with the other memories of their parents, which involves giving them temporary control of their bodies. Oh, this couldn't go badly. Not (laughs) ever. (laughs) Scary stuff. Yeah. But why risk this, right? Like this is like halfway to abomination already. Right. Giving up control of your body. Why do this? The answer is because they need advice. They need guidance. There are a lot of moving parts at the moment. Alia has become abomination. Their grandmother is back on Arrakis for some reason they don't know yet. Leto is having very concerning, prescient dreams. And of course, they're struggling with their own uncertainties around being preborn and what that means for them. So they just have a lot on their plates and they need to turn to their parents for advice. And this is the best way they know how to do that. Right. So Ghani starts singing this beautiful song that Chani actually used to sing to Paul as they both sort of release control and fall into these trances, allowing the memories of their parents to come forth. And the way it's described in the book is actually kind of terrifying to imagine. Yeah. Quote, the transformation came over him with a frightening duality, as though Leto were a dark screen against which his father was projected. He felt both his own flesh and his father's, and the flickering differences threatened to overcome him. End quote. <laughs> cool. Ugh. Cool. Yeah. That like gives me goosebumps just reading that. Just, ugh. That feels so uncomfortable. What a weird thing to like still be conscious of yourself, but to lose control of yourself as someone else has projected onto you. The flickering differences between their flesh. <laughs> it's like, okay. I mean, my dad's shorter than me. So with the, <laughs> I feel 5'10", 5'11". Like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> Man, it's awful. It sounds awful. Now, what's interesting is it's actually easier in this moment for Ganema to slip into Chani's persona memory than it is for Leto to slip into Paul's. Right. In fact, there's even this weird little moment where he almost accidentally like takes a wrong turn in his <laughs> right. other memory and yeah. takes on Duke Leto, his grandfather's persona instead, before he like, you know, U turns the car and gets gets back on the correct <laughs> highway exit. Right. We learned that it's actually easier for females to use other memory, which explains a lot about the Benny Gesserit. And You know, that's, of course, a double-edged sword because it also means it's much more dangerous for them to use other memory. They're much more susceptible to this sort of thing. Memory Paul and Memory Chani have now taken over the bodies of their children, and they're just having a conversation as they look out over the desert. Mm -hmm. From this brief exchange, we learn that Paul had, at some point, shared a terrifying last vision with Chani. We also learned that this vision has yet to pass. Right. Memory Paul explains to Memory Johnny, actually, that there's still work to be done to bring about this final vision he saw, this vision that we know will be come to know as the golden path. Quote, Muadib, the hero, must be destroyed utterly. Otherwise, this child cannot bring us back from chaos. End quote. Oof. And now we can sort of begin to understand why he walked out into the desert. He wanted to bring down his own godhood. He needed to end this society, this religion, this government that he created because his final vision showed him that was the way to salvation for humanity. It's at this moment that Leto feels his father's temptation to take over his body. This other memory's like, wait a second, I'm already in the driver's seat. This is kind of cool. Yeah. This is nice. I don't want to go back to the passenger seat. The air conditioning <laughs> on that side doesn't work. I was going to say, sucks when you say, hey, can you, uh, you you can borrow my car for the weekend, and then they just decide to keep your car. You're like, fuck, <laughs> dude, <laughs> give me back my Honda. <laughs> right. 
my Honda Civic, my pride and joy. I, I think you mean my Honda Civic <laughs> drives into the sunset. <laughs> but Paul, <laughs> come back. Right. Paul is very tempted to take Leto's Honda Civic, but yeah. <laughs> to memory Paul's credit, he resists the urge. Yeah. He hands the keys back to Leto. But before his father can completely retreat, Leto's got some questions. That's why we're all here. We need answers to stuff. So he starts desperately asking his father questions. And he starts by asking about Alia and Abomination. Hey, dad, is the same thing going to happen to us? Can me and Ganema avoid this Abomination fate? Right. Paul's answers are not super hopeful or particularly clear. He says that the same Baron that has taken over Alia does in fact exist in the twins, which implies that the threat is still there for the twins. And even now, in this very moment, it took a tremendous amount of effort from Paul to not take over Leto's body. And Paul is not like a antagonistic memory, right? Like this is literally a father and a son. Right. And even then, there was extreme temptation for the other memory to have to overcome. Imagine what it's like for some ancestor who doesn't give a shit about Leto and just wants the body. I'll also say really quickly, I wasn't sure if I should say this later, but it, it literally just occurred to me. Do you think Paul, with his Bene Gesserit training and having passed the Gamjabar test, would have something to do with his ability to resist that temptation? Mm. That like animal desire to live again and to say, oh, I like this. This is great. He has the experience of being human, of saying, I understand animal urges and I can resist them even at my own detriment for the good of the you know, plan. Yeah, that is an amazing point. Paul also, in this moment, gives us this like really beautiful yet horrifying description of how other memory and these personas within the twins actually work. And I found this really interesting. This is maybe our clearest definition of how these, like the parameters of how other memory works. Right. Quote, we live only through the reflection of your awareness. Your memory creates us. The danger, it is a precise memory. And those of us who loved power and gathered it at any price, those can be more precise. End quote. Yeah. I just found this quote really beautiful because it, Speaks to a universal human experience of keeping our loved ones alive in our thoughts, right? But it takes it to this like sci fi fantasy extreme in the book where Ganema and Leto may remember their parents, but they remember them a little too well to the point where their parents can take over their bodies. But moving on, Leto, of course, is understandably shaken. And his instinct in that moment is just. Hey dad, what uh how about you take the Honda? Like <laughs> take you it. Yeah. take take control. He offers his father control because in his mind the justification is if I'm going to become abomination eventually no matter what, I'd rather it be my own dad than someone like the Baron. Right. That seems logical in the moment, but we realize that it it's at the end of the day it's still a lose-lose. Quote any possession reduced the possessed to abomination, end quote. Yeah, I didn't quite get this. I guess I'm still a little unclear as to like what the risk would be giving Paul the Honda. But ultimately, I, Paul knows best and, and Leto knows best. So them both saying in no uncertain terms, this cannot happen. I was like, okay, <laughs> understood. Totally. We, we do have to do a little bit of trusting them that this is a bad thing because they don't exactly spell it out for us, but my interpretation was perhaps that if a memory takes over a real body, it's like a, it's not a complete person, right? Like it's a, it would be a lesser form of both of them. It wouldn't quite be Leto anymore. It would just be his body. And it wouldn't quite be Paul because it would just be his memory. It wouldn't be the complete person of memories and body. That's a good point. It would be like a lesser shade of both of those people. And thus, it, like an incomplete person, right? Like they maybe wouldn't be able to live up to their full capabilities. Yeah, it's probably that's pretty good. <laughs> Leto does recognize in this moment, he does a bit of self-reflection 
and he realizes that it's his uncertainties, this like fear of the unknown that is weakening his resolve. He's not out here just giving up his body because he wants to. He's scared of what's to come. Right. And his thoughts then sort of naturally wander toward this idea of prescience. Quote, with the spice, he could breathe the future, shatter time's veils. He found the temptation difficult to shed, clasped his hands, and sank into the prana bindu awareness, end quote. <sighs> breathed the future. Frank, good book. <laughs> good book and good character writing. Like, yeah. of course, if you're scared of a thing you're pretty sure is going to happen in the future, wouldn't you want to know? If someone was like, yeah, here's the key. You can open that door and find out if you're going to get heart disease in the future. Right. Yeah. Like most of us would be like, fuck, I'm going to open that door. I got to know for sure. Yeah, totally. And that's the same thing happening with Leto here. He does, however, recognize the dangers. So he fights the temptation. He goes into that prana bindu training that he knows. And this leads to him saying one of, I think, the most beautiful lines in all of the Dune saga. And, and one of like the core theses of this whole series. Quote, the joy of living, its beauty is all bound up in the fact that life can surprise you. End quote. <sighs> Man, that's so much better than fear is the mind killer. <laughs> <laughs> Why isn't this people's tattoos? <laughs> wow. The joy of life, that it can surprise you. Yeah. Ah, I love that. Okay, following up that beautiful quote, we the table's got to turn a little bit uh, because shit gets really dark really quick. He turns to his sister and realizes, oh, fuck, that's still my mom. Yeah. Because memory Chani has refused to give up control of Ganima's body. And this leads to a very tense couple of paragraphs where Leto is pleading with his mother to release control, to give back her daughter's body and memory paul even resurfaces for a little bit to tell chani that if she does this thing he will despise her forever this internal battle within ganima goes on until sunrise that blows my mind too it very casually is like many hours later i'm like excuse me <laughs> right you have to pause for a second to realize this is an hours long struggle right for gani to get her body back and for chani to finally agree and retreat right the twins do recover from this deadly exercise and they then sort of debrief they discuss what they've learned as they are heading back into the siege and toward this next meeting they have with jessica right it's become clear to them that this golden path that their father saw this final vision is the same thing that Leto is now glimpsing in his dreams. And it also seems to be the only path forward that makes sense, where perhaps they survive or humanity survives. We don't quite know the details yet, Yeah, but the alternative paths are full of danger. This seems to be the only one where the outcome is good. Right. And they ultimately decide to commit to some plan some plot some scheming that they've clearly been talking about off page we don't know the details yet quote we will accompany each other into deathliness though only one may return to report it end quote heavy on the foreshadowing there we don't quite know what that means but we know they're headed into danger right and that carries us beautifully into chapter 14 chapter 14 takes us back to the Carino Palace on Seleucus Secundus with our boy, Faradin. Faradin and Tychonic are walking around the gardens, discussing plans for, you know, eliminating the Atreides twins and the uh, kind of return of the Carino throne. And it's clear from this conversation that Faradin is, like, very on the fence about being emperor <laughs> of the whole universe. <laughs> He's yeah. like, ooh, mm. here's the quote. Faradin chewed his lower lip. Duty held him here, but he felt frustrated. He would far rather have gone to the rock enclave where the sand trout experiments were being conducted. End quote. Okay. I'm getting real, like, high school musical vibes here. Yeah. 
Faradin just wants to dance. I just want to dance, Tychonic. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I want to be in the art studio making sculptures, dude. It's like, but you have to be emperor of thousands of planets. No, I want to dance. So, <laughs> Tychonic then reveals that he's brought a practitioner of oniromancy. I think you nailed it. My God, I'm on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> if only I could say Faradin correctly 10 out of 10 times, I'd be, I'd be unstoppable. <laughs> oniromancy. Uh, to to help the prince decipher his dreams. Now, Varadin's like super, he's kind of Gen Z about this. He's he's Gen Alpha about this. <laughs> he's like, uh, you're old man Tychonix out here, this ancient, you know, millennial, <laughs> so old. Uh, uh, old. He's being superstitious. He's recently converted to his newfound kind of Fremen religion, but he decides to humor him. Sure, Uncle Tychonic, I'll do the thing, or whatever. Right. I'll meet the interpreter of dreams. And with that, <laughs> who does Tychonic bring forward? Oh my god. Other than the fucking preacher. <laughs> the absolute mic drop moment this is. You thought he was out in the desert? You're an idiot. <laughs> He's on <laughs> Seleucus Secundus right now. Which, of course, we find out through... Tychonic's inner thoughts is all part of Winsicia's plan. Now, the preacher is wearing a black Ixian mask that covers his entire face and smells of sour spice, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, the worst flavor of big five gum. <laughs> sour <Ew>. spice. <laughs> two, two of those flavors you love to see next to each other. <laughs> right. Ugh. The Faradin, the curious lad he is, tries to talk about the mask for a second, but the preacher basically cuts the chase and is like, no, let's not talk about the mask. Let's talk about your dreams. Faradin shares his dream. Quote, He told about the water flowing upward in the well, about the worlds, which were atoms, dancing in his head, about the snake, which transformed itself into a sandworm and exploded in a cloud of dust. Telling about the snake... He was surprised to discover required more effort. End quote. So, Mr. Preacher, uh, what does it mean? Tell us. Uh -huh. Interpret. Uh -huh. And he has interpreted. It's very useful. It's very helpful. He's interpreted fully. He's like, cool. I got it. <laughs> Time to share your interpretation. And, of course, in the most iconic troll move of all time. Oh, my God. And one that we referenced at the beginning of the episode. The Preacher says, quote, I said I'd interpret. I did not agree to tell you my interpretation. Holy <laughs> shit. Quote. Now, Faradin, Tychonic, the birds, the bees, and all of the readers are flabbergasted. <laughs> 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 and the preacher explains. He's like, listen, I get it. I understand the dream. And honestly, what I understand from the dream is that if I explained it, you wouldn't get it. You'd be frustrated, confused. You'd misinterpret it. It's uh, it's a waste of time telling you, so I'm not going to. Holy shit. Uh, m mind you, he is speaking to a, a prince of a very powerful house, former rulers of the whole galaxy. Yeah. And he's straight up just like, nah, you wouldn't get it, bro. Nah. And they're like actively threatening him. They're like, well, we'll kill you on the spot. And he's like, no, nah, no, you won't. <laughs> it's amazing. Just just the wrinkly old balls on this man <laughs> to stand yeah. here and, and say these things to a, to a prince. Yeah, take a second, picture it. <laughs> it's, He's from it's, the desert, so they're like really, really, really crusty. Yeah. <laughs> mm, delicious. Dehydrated, yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Tychonic and Faradin, as we're sort of implying, are furious they're like this sucks dude this is the worst magic show ever <laughs> i did magic it just wasn't in this room what you're fired magician <laughs> so you know they're warning the preacher they're basically giving him these ultimatum after ultimatum threats like you got to tell us you got to make it clearer you got to make us happy or we'll kill you the preacher flexes on them again he doesn't give two shits he knows they won't kill him he's like no no you won't because they know his value. And what is that value? Well, 
he's promised them someone. Quote, the preacher held out his right hand. If I but beckon with this hand, Duncan Idaho will come to me and he will obey me. End quote. Okay. A twist <sighs> I was hmm. not expecting. Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, that's a big bargaining chip. Now, Farodin, to his credit, and I kind of liked the way he's written in this scene, is like, you know what? Actually, I like this guy. Like, this preacher guy is, is kind of funny in how much he doesn't give a shit <laughs> about his, like, personal safety. Uh, so he's like, you know what? You stay here. Stay here in the palace, Mr. Preacher Man. In fact, I've decided you're going to stay here in the palace as my interpreter of dreams, <laughs> even if you never tell me. You just <laughs> interpret things. You can interpret the bushes. You can interpret the bugs. I don't know. Don't tell me. I like it. You're cool. And the preacher, if you thought he was done flexing, you'd be dead wrong. The preacher is like, no, <laughs> I'm good. Thanks for the invitation, but pff, seriously, no. Uh, I've got shit back on uh, Arrakis to do. Incredible. Again, I hope, dear listener, that you're imagining the wrinkly old balls on this man. <laughs> Listen, if you have nightmares after this episode, it's all Abu. He's the one bringing this energy to the <laughs> recording. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just blown away. I'm just blown away by the preacher's audacity in this entire literal scene. testicles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. It, it, the audacity of the preacher is legendary. It's great. I love it. Now he does have a little document on his side, a uh, binding agreement with the guild, and so he has to return to Arrakis. It's not really up for debate. And before he departs, he offers some advice. And this part is just fascinating. Like, I love when Frank almost gets meta in his writing, and clearly the preacher is starting to maybe share a broad take on the philosophy and politics and the nature of rule and how maybe fragile it can be. And thus, we're going to return to this as one of our takeaways. Yeah. The chapter ends with the preacher promising to deliver Duncan Idaho as they've agreed. Quote, Duncan Idaho is yours. Have a care how you use him. He is a jewel beyond price. End quote. Oh, man. Dude, I don't know if the preacher is like wingmanning for Duncan Idaho at this point, but that's a good line. Like, Hell yeah. Hey, have you met my buddy over here? Oh, he's a jewel beyond price. <laughs> Good Lord. Preacher. Yeah. If all of my boys aren't out here wingmanning me like this from now on, <laughs> they're no longer my boys. Right. <laughs> they don't get to drive the Honda ever. <laughs> <laughs> ever. Anyway, we agree, Preacher. Duncan Idaho. Jewel beyond price. Indeed. Okay, folks. One more chapter to go in today's dense summary. Buckle up. Chapter 15. <laughs> this one's wild. Because we're in the boxing ring once again. It's the showdown of the century. Leto versus Lady Jessica. Grandson versus grandmother. Pre-born versus Reverend Mother. Coming to you live tonight, 8 p.m. on CBS Primetime. Oh! Bip, 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 bip. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're all appropriately hyped for this chapter. Nine-year-old boxing, uh, like 75-year-old <laughs> <laughs> woman. <laughs> <laughs> who's been in retirement for 20 years. Fascinating. Yeah. The cage fight you didn't know you wanted. <laughs> oh my gosh. Incredible. So we are back in Siege to Burn. Jessica Leto sitting down, having this interview in much the same way that Jessica had her conversation with Ganema a few chapters ago. And the goal here for Jessica is similar. She's trying to suss out if her grandson has succumbed to abomination. The difference, of course, is... Leto is not pulling any punches. This conversation is much more confrontational. Right. So they begin with a bit of a back and forth about the nature of being pre-born. And right off the bat, it becomes quickly obvious to us that Jessica is out of her depth. Especially once this nine-year-old little Leto starts using the mannerisms and speech patterns of 
both her late lover, Duke Leto, and her late son, Paul Atreides. Right. This completely throws her off. And Leto is doing all of this very intentionally. (laughs) Yeah. This is all part of his game plan here in this conversation. Quote, he shook his head gently, knowing it to be a bizarre gesture of adulthood on a child's body, reminding himself that he must keep this woman off balance, end quote. Mm. That's the goal right there. Keep Jessica off balance. Make this so weird for her <laughs> yeah. that she can't focus. The conversation then turns toward the topic of abomination, the giant sandworm in the room. And this is where Leto assures his grandmother that, no, he is not like his Aunt Alia. Quote, I've not looked outside our garden of time, at least not by seeking it out. I know the trap of prescience. My father's life tells me what I need to know about it. End quote. Mm. And as we discussed in the last few episodes, we know that Alia's use of spice plays a significant part in why she fell to abomination. So Leto's trying to make it clear, no, I haven't taken spice. I haven't peered into the future. I'm not taking the same risks that my aunt is. Right. Leto then changes the topic of conversation and turns to more immediate dangers, revealing to his grandmother that, um, hey, Alia's going to abduct you. And he even suspects that Alia and Wincisia are colluding. Hashtag no collusion. (laughs) And their goals are clearly aligned, he explains. Alio intends to keep the regency, doesn't want to give it up to Leto once he comes of age. And when Sissia, as we know, has her own schemes to try and get Faradin on the throne. So for now, both parties are interested in not letting Leto take the Atreides throne, as is his right. Right. Jessica is like weirdly dense about this like she's just like refusing to believe alia would take actions like this work with the carinos abduct her mother she would never she's my daughter (laughs) right the conversation continues and turns toward the future where leto hints to his grandmother that he knows of a way he will live thousands of years and we can assume that this is perhaps something that he has seen in his golden path jessica panics. She assumes he's talking about the Bene Gesserit metabolic control, something that she knows her daughter is already doing. Alia looks as young as she did years ago, hasn't aged a day in years. Right. Using this power, using their physical and mental control in this way, is strictly forbidden for the Bene Gesserit. Quote, the manipulation of internal chemistry was available to initiates of the sisterhood. But if one did it, sooner or later, all would try it. There could be no concealing such an accumulation of ageless women. They knew for a certainty that this would lead them to destruction. Short-lived humanity would turn upon them. No, it was unthinkable. End quote. Yeah. My God, another Benny Gesserit power we've all had no idea about because they're hiding it. Yeah. It's very cool. It's very cool world building. It's such a cool power with incredible possibilities to think about. And it's, uh, I don't know about you, Leo, this is certainly one power I'd abuse the fuck out of. It speaks to the importance of the human test, right? Because people who don't have the restraint to make like sometimes self-sacrificing choices would be like, yeah, I'm going to fucking live forever. <laughs> what are you talking about? So... That's why they're like, well, if we're going to give you Bene Gesserit training up to and including metabolic control, we have to be sure that you have the self-restraint not to abuse this power. Because as soon as one does, everyone else will go, well, the cat's out of the bag. I guess I'll live forever. And then the Bene Gesserit will be hunted down for the witches that many people actively call them (laughs) and think that they are. Yep. That's an excellent point. Like they have to be able to put the needs of the sisterhood above their own desires. Right. Hilariously, Leto completely brushes this aside. Yeah. He's like, oh, oh, grandma, (laughs) that old trick, 
that's so fucking cringe, bro. Like I, I'm talking about something else. I don't care about that metabolic control. Yeah, that cat in that bag. Oh, boring, boring cat, boring bag. <laughs> <laughs> Not what I'm talking about. <laughs> Gen Z man, or what? He what is he? Gen Alpha? What are we Gen calling Alpha. him? Gen <laughs> Alpha. He's I mean, beyond he's, Gen Z. <laughs> if he's nine years old, then he'd probably be Gen Alpha, right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Jessica, of course, is like, what? Please explain yourself. And <laughs> I'm a baby boomer. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> He's like the cloud, <laughs> the cloud grandma. <laughs> the cloud grandma. And she's like, what? Floppy disks? <laughs> she insists that he explain himself. And this is where Leto goes off into these like Zensuni style, like philosophical tangents about the nature of time. Yeah. And this is where he completely loses. Honestly, both me and Jessica, uh, <laughs> yeah, same. we're left utterly confused. What is he talking about? He's kind of rambling in philosophical circles. And only the teeth grew. What? <laughs> what? what? <laughs> huh? I mean, no. What? <laughs> so to wrap up, this conversation returns eventually to Alia and her plan for abduction. He's like, Grandma, we got to talk about this. This thing's about to happen. As Jessica is nervously sort of fiddling with the gum jabar that's hidden in her robe. Once again, Leto, in control of the conversation, calls her out. He points right to the robe and asks if she plans to kill her own daughter. And then he goes on to scold her for walking out on her daughter. And when she starts to sort of protest, he uses the voice on her. Yeah. Incredible. Something Paul hadn't mastered five years older than Leto is now. Like, something Paul was still learning at, a, as four, at 14 or 15 years old. Leto does it in a way that shocks her to her core. Yeah, it's incredible. It's this moment where it becomes clear to Jessica how powerful this young child is. And... It's revealed to her just how well he's totally played her. Right. Like he's used her Benny Gesserit training against her. He's played her like a fiddle this entire time. Quote, now you know how profoundly you were conditioned by your precious Benny Gesserits, he said. End quote. And we're going to talk a bit more deeply about this quote and much more of Leto's manipulation later in the takeaways because there's right. so many more layers to this. Yeah. But for now, to wrap up this summary and to wrap up this chapter, before he leaves, Leto basically <laughs> outright commands his grandmother. He's just like thrown off all pretense at this point. He commands his grandmother to allow herself to be abducted. It's all part of the plan. She's got to let it happen. White van, take the candy. Just do it. <laughs> Don't ask <laughs> just questions. Just do it. Trust me. Trust me. He meets Ganima outside after leaving the room and he tells her that it worked. And we can assume that whatever the twins are planning, whatever plan they've got cooking in the oven is coming together nicely. And this conversation with Jessica, this sort of manipulation of her is all part of it. And I just, I'm left just as shocked as Jessica by the end of this chapter. Yeah. As a rule, I am afraid of nine-year-olds in general. <laughs> yeah. But I think... Leto takes the cake as the scariest nine-year-old of all. What an incredible chapter. Yeah. Really fun to see the kind of expert tactician Jessica off her ground, like so thrown off and gives you a sense of how unbelievably powerful Leto has the potential to be. Yeah. So that's our summary for today. Three very large, very dense chapters in today's reading. So much to unpack and so much to discuss. But before we get into our key takeaways and our spice morsels, we're going to take another break. So don't go anywhere. Welcome back, everybody. I oh, hope you had a good break. Hope you talked to a nine-year-old. Hope it didn't <laughs> shake you to your core. <laughs> Let's talk about the politics of the preacher. Ooh, I loved this so much Ugh. okay let's break it down preacher giving fraud and advice right we know politics is a core pillar of dune 
It is one of the things that holds this entire story up. Let's break down this advice that the preacher is giving Faradin and through it, explore on a meta level what Frank is trying to say about the nature of politics and power and ambition and government. Taking it line by line, the preacher starts off by telling Faradin, quote, Governments may rise and fall for reasons which appear insignificant, Prince. What small events? An argument between two women. Which way the wind blows on a certain day? A sneeze, a cough, the length of a garment, or the chance collision of a fleck of sand and a courtier's eye. End quote. Oh, I love that. Love it so, so much. It fits with so much of what we've talked about, both in Dune and in Dune Messiah. This idea of government and power being finite. It's something we talked so much about in our Dune Messiah book club episodes. Paul struggled with this. He could see the futures. He could see the infinite ways that his life, his power, his loved ones, his government, his society would crumble in the face of eternity, in the face of time. Everything is finite. Yeah. And this is the preacher saying the same exact thing that Paul used to in Dune Messiah. Also setting up Anakin. He's like, <laughs> sand. sand. Gets everywhere. Courtier's <laughs> eyes. <laughs> Toppling governments. It's rough. It's coarse. <laughs> sand is the true antagonist of the Dune saga. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> now, the preacher continues. Quote, it is not always the majestic concerns of imperial ministers which dictate the course of history, nor is it necessarily the pontifications of priests which move the hands of God. End quote. Uh, I love it. <laughs> oh my God. I love this so much. The preacher just straight, I mean, we know the ball is on this man, but now out, he's out here just shooting down this idea of power. Yeah. That being powerful does not mean your whim controls everything. Right. Which, which is often a hard pill to swallow for people who obtain power and influence to realize that like the world doesn't revolve around them. Right. In fact, it even speaks to this like paradox of power, right? That like oftentimes the more power you obtain, the less you're actually able to exert it. Yeah. Because you're constrained more and more. The greater your power grows in, in this weird paradox. That's just the nature of, of uh, power and ambition. I also love, so that line, the pontifications of priests which move the hands of God. At first, on a very surface level, it sounds like a criticism of that kind of organized faith. You know, that like, that it's these men, flesh and blood men, who are sort of like directing the perceived will of God. But also in the universe of Dune, this is a world in which many men say that Muad'Dib was God. This is a universe of flesh and blood gods. So you think about someone like Korba, who would try to kind of move Muad'Dib's will to his own benefit. And that's not always the way it works. Right. So this this kind of criticism of works in two very different ways, but both of which are very resonant and very something that I think the preacher is going to stand behind as a as a sort of podium. For real. And it also feels like something Frank himself would say. Oh, yeah, totally. Reading these words, I was like, Frank, is Frank, is this you? <laughs> is this you? Is this is you, you, Frank? Is this your Honda, Frank? <laughs> kind of feels like you're Honda. It's so, <laughs> it's so clear to me that Frank is speaking directly to the reader here through the preacher. I love it. Okay, moving on. Faradin is moved by these words, much the same way we are, but he can't really put a finger on why. He doesn't truly understand what about these words is resonating with him. He needs to listen to this uh, book club series, our podcast. <laughs> yes, he does. We'll explain it, Faradin. No worries. <laughs> the preacher clarifies further, quote, if you would succeed, you must reduce your strategy to its point of application. Where does one apply strategy? At a particular place with a particular people in mind. But even with the greatest concern for minutia, some small detail with no significance attached to it will escape you. Can your strategy, Prince, 
be reduced to the ambitions of a regional governor's wife. End quote. Oh, it's just so good. It's just so good. This continues this theme of what we're talking about. The larger your influence gets, the more power you have, the more diluted your rule. And the thing that comes to mind for me here is the American presidential election. Like a candidate often starts off by very much appealing to their base. Right. But if they do end up winning and if that base carries them to the White House, they suddenly have to figure out how to appeal to an entire nation of people, which, because the way the system is set up, right. most of whom never voted for that person. <laughs> and in fact, in a two-party system, often close to half of whom voted for exactly not that person. <laughs> yes. Like, if this was like a nine-party country, then yeah, it's like, well, yeah, I kind of had mixed feelings, but it's like, sure, yeah, that's great. This and this is a very divisive thing here in in our this country of ours. So a hundred percent, this is a great analogy. Yeah, and it's just so fascinating to think that you would work so hard on your campaign, you become the president, you wield all this power now. You are one of the most influential people in the country, but now you're stuck because you can't make everyone happy. Right. You have all this power, but you don't, can't actually wield it successfully with every single person in the country this to me reads as an amazing argument against too much power being consolidated in a single source which we know is such an important theme all throughout the dune saga this warning against propping up charismatic leaders giving them all the power giving them all the influence right they simply can't wield it <laughs> enough to make everyone happy that power becomes diluted and I think what the preacher is trying to get at here basically is because that power becomes too concentrated, it can also lead to that government or that individual's ultimate downfall. Can every government strategy be reduced to the ambitions of a regional governor's wife? No. In response to this, Tychonic gets all huffy and <laughs> the preacher then drops one of my favorite lines in the book, quote, ambitions tend to remain undisturbed by realities, end quote. Better than fear is the mind killer. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good quote. I love it. I love this vendetta of yours to like take down fear is the mind killer. It's just so overrated. It's good. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's very good because y'all are used you. to reading boring ass books. <laughs> These books are full of good stuff. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Ambition often being undisturbed by reality. I mean, blind ambition is something, you know, we, we all know about. How it can be the downfall of people who just chase power. Now, the preacher concludes his advice to Faradin by telling him that the prince has great potential. The preacher sees great potential within him, but that he's being led by people who want nothing but power for power's sake, and that is dangerous. Quote, You've given no thought to the kind of society you might prefer. You do not consider the hopes of your subjects. Even the form of the imperium which you seek has little shape in your imaginings. And quote. It seems to me that the preacher here is at this point straight up calling out for Aden for being a puppet. Right. We know when Sissia is fully in control of all of this. The whole reason the preacher's even here is because when Sissia and Tychonic secretly planned it. The preacher is saying, hey, buddy, I know you're young, but have you actually thought about this? Like, right, right. emperor of the known universe, there's a lot to think about there. Have you thought about any of it? Or are you just doing what your mom tells you to? Or what you think is expected of you as a Carino prince, as an heir to a great house? Right. Also, dude, like Faradin on the throne, my guy would be assassinated so quick. <laughs> And because it's like when Sissia and Tychonic are idiots and it's just like the idea of this poor kid who's just being pushed along on mommy's plan to put him on the throne, the preacher going, buddy, you got to really think about this. You sure, maybe you'll end up ruling the universe, but you got to, you got to want it. 
You got to be passionate about it. You have to have a plan. If a fleck of sand gets into a courtier's eye, does your entire government crumble? Well, then maybe this isn't the thing for you. Oh, it's just so good. It's so good. And on a meta level, Frank is, of course, saying this about anyone who gets into politics because they want to be president. Right. It's like, yo, are you ready for that, though? Like, do you actually know what that means or do you just want the prestige and title and the influence? So I love the meta commentary here as well. The preacher then specifically at this moment turns to Tychonic when he says these final lines, quote, your eye is upon the power, not upon its subtle uses and its perils. Your future is filled thus with manifest unknowns, with arguing women, with coughs and windy days, end quote. Beautiful. Oh my God. Beautiful. The fact that he turns to Tychnik and fucking stares that guy down as he basically says this warning. He's like, yo, you're not thinking about this either. This to me feels like the preacher knows way more than he's letting on about the Carino plot. Yeah. And about what's taking place here on Seleucus Secundus. And him turning to Tychnik and saying this is another way, I think, of planting doubt within this plan. He's already got Fraudin on edge. Now he turns to Tychonic and he's like, are you thinking about this too, my guy? Yeah. Or are you only chasing power because when Sissia is only chasing power? Because of the spider, right? Right. It's amazing. It, it, it's the preacher here calling these two men out for not considering the responsibility that comes with such power and just being ambitious for the sake of being ambitious, that blind ambition. That can be the downfall of so many. It's amazing. Uh, just to wrap up this takeaway, I'm just blown away by, this is just a few paragraphs in the book, and they're so jam-packed. Like so many layers and possibilities, not only for the story itself, by what's taking place between Tychonic, Faradin, and the Preacher, but also this extra layer of meta-commentary on politics from Frank. It's so good. This is the kind of stuff that makes me love Dune so much. Oh, it's so good. Well, the next takeaway we have is titled, sort of tongue-in-cheek, The Playing of Lady Jessica. Yeah. So let's talk about this little chapter where Leto II, this little, this giant chapter. <laughs> and I've got to say, it starts with the end of the chapter for me. Because I got through the chapter and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. But then you get to this portion, and we get these quotes describing basically Leto II's effect on Jessica. Quote, The realization remained. This unchild had been playing her like a fine instrument throughout their interview. End quote. Another one. Quote, Her belief in words lay shattered. Leto had forced her to look her physical universe squarely in the face, and she'd come away shaken her mind running with a new awareness. Oh, End quote, I love that one. Incredible. And then finally, quote, not since her earliest schooling days on Wallach, not since those terrifying days before the Duke's buyers came for her, not since then had she felt such trembling uncertainty about her next moments. End quote. Literally being shocked back to childhood by this conversation. And... There's a line that I think you and I both kind of got caught up on. And this, this is really what drove this takeaway for me, is, is this line about her flesh obeying other commands. And then Leto being like, yeah, you fucking get it now. How deeply you were conditioned by your precious Benny Gesserit. Right. That idea really stuck with me, and I realized I didn't fully understand it. So what I want to do is let's go through the conversation and let's focus in on what is Leto II doing and how is he doing it. So early on, he directly references her fluttering lips as an affectionate turn of phrase that uh, Duke Leto used to use in private, which <laughs> naturally shocks her. She's like, that's well, okay, that's a lot coming from my nine-year-old grandson. Uh, yeah. Secret little pet phrase from my from my lover. Okay, cool. <laughs> Good. Glad this conversation's going this way. 
He returns to that phrase moments later when she describes what he's saying as prattle. Why do you prattle on about abomination? And first he says, he knows the, quote, Benny Gesserit can't, which I had to look up the word can't in this use. I was like, C-A-N-T, no apostrophe. Even Google Docs was like, I think you, you're missing an apostrophe. And I'm like, no. <laughs> this looks like a typo. <laughs> it looks like a typo. It does. Uh, but can't in this case is a uh, religious can't, which is hypocrisy or insincerity. Mm, okay. He knows the Bene Gesserit hypocrisy and insincerity as well as she does. And, quote, I want more than the fluttering of your lips, end quote. I took this, by the way, as two meanings. I want more than just empty words, right? The flapping of your lips. I just yep. don't make useless sounds, Jessica, come on. But also, the fluttering of her lips is indicative of her discomfort. He's not looking for her to be uncomfortable. He's looking to awaken her to a possibility, which is that she's more deeply conditioned than she's aware. Yeah. Two possible meanings there. Listeners might be thinking this as well, but I want to acknowledge that Leto's kind of being mean here. <laughs> yeah, totally. And as part of the manipulation, you know, it's intentional. There's a purpose to it. He's not just out here being emotionally mean to his grandmother for no reason. But I do want to acknowledge that, yeah, I mean, he's, he's just like, old woman, stop blabbing. I need you to not blab and waste my time. Like, he, he is outright throwing her off balance by being cruel, in a sense. You're totally right. And he leans into that meanness a couple of times, really intentionally. And actually, one of these times, he almost talks about prescience and, you know, this idea of, like, prescience requiring basically boredom <laughs> and, like, creating not being surprised by the universe. But he instead digresses and is then, like, taunting her about her Harkonnen lineage. Like, oh, who are Harkonnens? Who even are those you know, we, we talk about them as if they're these beasts, but we are them, right? We are of them. And this, of course, sets up uh, later returning to the Harkonnen, the fact of her Harkonnen lineage as blackmail that the Bene Gesserit are going to get to. But right. he's just setting it up. He's putting the ball on the tee, ready to swing a little bit later. And I promise at this point, I am building to a point. <laughs> so, <laughs> We're with you. Take us on this ride. Good, 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 good. Now, he gets her to say his name, to say Leto. And it says in the, you know, it says kind of as an aside, she managed to speak his name for the first time. I checked. This is the first time she said Leto in the book. Holy shit. I, it's shocking because they, she talks about Leto and Ganema, but she always says my grandchildren, or she always says to Ganema, your brother. And Ganema says his name a lot. And, Jessica's always like, yeah, him. <laughs> and it's just, it's so cool. And I totally missed this the first time. Yeah. It's also, you imagine, like painful for her to say that name. Yeah, that's true too, of course. And I think also what Leto is doing here is he's intentionally driving her into a place where she is remembering Paul and specifically Duke Leto Atreides because Duke Leto Atreides was the thing that convinced her to disobey the Bene Gesserit orders. Mm. Leto Atreides is emblematic of her betrayal of the Bene Gesserit sisterhood. He is the thing that motivated her to disobey orders. He is something that she, is, she needs to remember and be in touch with so that she is Jessica and not some pawn being moved by the Bene Gesserit. Mm. That's a great point. He shocks her with Alia's plan to abduct her, and she reflects, oh, yeah, I've done this before. You, like, get them thinking about one thing, and then, bam, you hit them with another, right? Yeah. Shake their bones. <laughs> that old <laughs> thufir tactic. Shake yes. those old bones. <laughs> but it works, and she's shaken. Her bones are shaken. She's confused and afraid. And then he, he gets her to be angry by, quote, a sneer in his voice. This is Leto too. He's not doing shit accidentally. He's goading her. He's taunting her into anger suddenly out of that fear and confusion. Like, all of this is his manipulation, right? 
Mm-hmm. And this is when he gets me. He calls Jessica dense, which is <laughs> hilarious. And he says the sisterhood, quote, is nothing but a bunch of damn fool old women. <laughs> Holy shit, Leto. Tell us how you really feel. Yeah, that's his review on Yelp. It's just <laughs> <laughs> and he lays bare the plan to possibly interbreed him and his sister, preserving their genes. Now, this is where he finally swings at that ball, the Harkonnen ball that he said on the tee earlier. He says, no, I know that they blackmailed you with your lineage. Right. And, and we get this line, quote, she felt completely subdued by his words, end quote. Wow. Like, thinking about what Leto's doing here, think about that mastery, that he's taken her from fear, confusion, to anger, and then suddenly he's shocking her into being totally complacent and like, I accept what you're saying and I'm here with you. Yeah. And of course, he immediately undoes it. <laughs> He's like, might be, uh, I, I might be immortal. I'm going to live forever. <laughs> and she's like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. She's already in a very emotionally vulnerable place. Yeah. So any bombshell he drops here, yeah, it's going to send her into a tailspin. And he plays it off like, oh, oh, yeah, that, oh, that old cat and that old bag, that whole joke we made earlier. <laughs> But no, he knows. He fucking knows that this is a thing. He's watching yeah. Alia do it. And he brings up in very vague terms, oh, I might live for thousands of years. <laughs> and this is where Jessica fucks up. Because she asks in a treatise about time. <laughs> She's like, oh, explain this whole time thing to me. And he's like, no, okay, fine, oh, sure. Oh, man. Welcome to my TED Talk. <laughs> and he finally, and he does. But throughout his por this portion of the, the kind of interaction, it's about two pages, he starts using these Zen Sunni style, style arguments that you pointed out earlier. But then he gets mean again. <laughs> he leans back into being mean. <laughs> quote, and we've talked, oh, we've talked about this quote, but I love it so much. Yeah, yeah. Quote, but I am shocked that you, you dare judge Alia. Of course she's broken the precious Benny Gesserit commandment. What did you expect? You ran out on her, left her as queen here in all but name. All of that power. So you ran back to Kaladin to nurse your wounds in Gurney's arms. Oh my God, shots fucking fired, <laughs> Leto. Man, what a unnecessarily mean way to put it. And <laughs> I know, Jesus. It's just brutal, <laughs> but so good. It's just like so brilliant. And of course, this prompts her to respond and as you pointed out he uses the fucking voice on her oh my god her reaction for me stands out as the incomplete thought it is right because what frank's doing here is he's telling us things but then he's not telling us things and what he's not telling us i think is almost more important quote as many times as she'd used the voice on others she'd never expected to be susceptible to it not ever again not since the school days when dot, 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 end quote. Oh, uh, what a tease, Frank. What a tease. And I think that tease may be the point. Now, all of this leads to Leto very casually in a turn of phrase using the word blindly. He refers to her as someone who acts blindly. And I think this gets a little bit into my interpretation of all of this, but I think that this is... He needs to reprogram her. He needs Jessica to be there as Jessica. And she's not going to be able to until she understands the depth of her programming. So how do you awaken her to it? How do you make her aware of it? You force her to look. And he uses the voice again. He compels her with his voice. Look inward. As I know you're able to, look inward. Also, I love her going, me, blindly. And he goes, blindly you <laughs> like <laughs> two sentences like yes what do you did i fucking stutter jessica yeah for real oh my god but he says look inward and this is where we get to the most compelling confusing and interesting aside right this passage jessica describes her quote flesh obeying other commands end quote her heart rate is spiked her she's feeling anxiety she has all these emotions in her body and none of them 
are part of her conscious awareness of her body. Like she has her understanding of herself and then there's this separate emotion happening. And Leto names it or basically says right after, yeah, yeah, you see what I'm talking about? Quote, how profoundly you were conditioned by your precious Benny Gesserits. Mm. I am not sure. And I'm going to say at the end of this, I want to hear your thoughts, dear listeners. But racking my brain about this, this is my theory. I think the Benny Gesserits, in raising their sisters, conditioned them naturally to do all sorts of things. But it sounds to me like Jessica has a base emotional reaction to things. You know, she's feeling frustrated. She's feeling anger. She's feeling anxious. Blindly, me, you know, things like that are, she feels are connected to her, to Jessica Harkonnen, basically, to Jessica. But no, maybe those are conditioned responses from the Bene Gesserit to steer her away from certain avenues of thought. Wow, yeah. Maybe those are literal emotional blinders on her, like a racehorse with these black blinders, keeping her from seeing the whole picture, which then makes those moments where Leto's going, no, recall your Duke. Recall Duke Leto Atreides, the fluttering of your lips. All of those little moments, he's going, remember the moment that you decided that the Bene Gesserit sisterhood was perhaps not the end-all answer to everything, and that you were able to make your own choice. Remember that moment, grandmother, because in that moment, you were you. I, I agree with that. Th this line had me stumped as well, because it's a little unclear and open to a lot of interpretation, what she means by flesh obeying other commands. But I love your theory on it, and I agree with it. I, I think there is a layer of Benny Gesserit control and conditioning in their sisterhoods. I think on another level, it could just be a world view as well. Right. She has been in the sisterhood her entire life. She has been told to think a certain way, to react a certain way. She has been trained to handle situations in a certain way. And when this monkey wrench called Leto is thrown <laughs> into all of that, yeah. it kind of bursts that bubble. I will wrap up by saying, I want to hear your thoughts, listeners. Uh, do you vibe with what we're saying? Do you have a completely different take? Seriously, let us know. You can email us, gamjabarpodcast at gmail.com, or you can Discord us. You can ping us in the Book Club Discord channel. So let us know. Regardless, it's clear that this chapter was super, super impactful and clearly a lot to kind of pick through. Really fun. Really cool. Yeah. Okay. And with that, our takeaways are out of the way. We've taken them away. <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> we're going to take a quick break now. But when we're back, again, I think I hear the oven. I think the oven's mm. uh, it's, it's almost ready. It's a couple more minutes. We have some 800 calorie, sorry, 600 calorie spice <laughs> morsels right after this. We'll be right back. Welcome back, folks. We hope you've spent some time reflecting on how profoundly this podcast has conditioned you. <laughs> Let's now dive into these delicious spice morsels mm. and chomp down. First up, Jessica's parentage. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. So we talked about this in our two-part Lady Jessica episodes, but it is worth revisiting here now that we've come across it in the book. Yeah. We have all known ever since the first book when Paul revealed it, that the Baron is Jessica's father. That was right. a huge bombshell in the first book. But it isn't until now that we are told who her mother is. Leto says, quote, it'll be in their breeding records. Jessica, out of Tanidia Neris by the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, end quote. Okay, we got ourselves a name. Sure. Jessica's mother was apparently someone named Tanidia Neris. But wait, this is Dune lore. It's messy. In our Guys Helen Moheim episode, we also discussed how Guys Helen Moheim is Jessica's mother. Right. So how do we reconcile this discrepancy? So in the encyclopedia, McNelly and the other authors wrote in 1984 that Guys Helen Moheim 
is Tanidia Neris, but that she was using a pseudonym when she basically seduced the Baron. McNelly later did admit that this is actually one detail that Frank Herbert disagreed on. He didn't care for it. He wasn't a big fan of it in the encyclopedia. Right. Of course, what makes it even messier is the Brian Herbert books, which we consider sort of third tier canon after Frank's words and the encyclopedia. Yeah. Doubles down on this Moheim being Tanidia Neris yeah. in the prequel sequel books that he wrote. So it's an unsettled topic. We can't provide you with a clear cut. This is what Frank thought and this is what Frank wanted. So this is what canon is. But those are the facts. Frank wasn't a big fan. In his books, he named someone named Tanidia Neris. Later on, McNelly in the encyclopedia said it was Moheim. And then Brian Herbert doubled down on that, claiming that Moheim was Tanadia Neris. Ultimately, up to you as a Dune fan to decide how to untangle that hilariously messy web of Dune lore. <laughs> Indeed. Next up, we have Shadoof! <laughs> so, if you're like me, when you hear Shadoof, you might think it's one of the newer generation Pokemon that you've missed out on. <laughs> the evolution of Bidoof. Bidoof into Shadoof. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's literally where my mind first went. But just to catch us all up, in this week's reading, Leto says the following to Ganema regarding their plan. Quote, I think of our plan as the toil of the Shadoof. End quote. Much like a Quinat, uh, Shadoofs are real pieces of people's lives today. If you live in Egypt, India, parts of, uh, parts of the Near East, you likely know what Shadoofs are, though they have different names in different countries. Basically, a Shadoof is a hand-constructed crane, kind of a wooden structure, used to lift water for irrigation purposes. Uh, so out of a well, you know, off, like over a riverbank, if you need to move a big bucket of water, which can get very heavy, you use a Shadoof. So, Basically, to wrap up this morsel, when Leto says their plan is the toil of the Shadoof, he's saying it's basic, it's rudimentary, it's nearly mechanical labor. Nothing, you know, no huge ego involved. But there's an additional layer to it, right? And there's actually two things here. Ganema points one of them out. Ganema says, well, to the Fremen, that sort of menial work of the land, right, you're kind of cultivating the, the nature around you, is also a cultivation of the soul and the spirit. It's impactful to your, your, your well-being. So that's great. But on another level, Leto is literally saying that their plan is, like the toil of the Shadoof, a lever that cultivates life and growth through the elevation of water, <laughs> hey. this ever-present pillar in so much of Dune's symbolism is the thing that the Shadoof moves, lifts water, elevates water. I love it. I also suspect uh, Frank was just like looking up early irrigation techniques and was like, oh, I should use that at some point. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Quinots, Shadoofs, cool. Like things that most Western readers will never have heard of. Um, so go out and catch a Shadoof today. <laughs> <laughs> Use your it, master water ball. They're, they're, really, they're really strong. <laughs> they're, they, are, they are very strong, yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> All right, one more morsel today, folks. You don't need this many calories, but we're giving them to you. <laughs> yeah. Benny Gesserit metabolic control. Yep. We learned about this incredible ability today. The Benny Gesserit can literally combat aging. To dig a bit deeper, according to the Dune Encyclopedia, this is a quote-unquote second-level functional state, and it's something that can only be achieved after mastering the basic Bene Gesserit arts of physical and mental control. More specifically, one of these second-level functions is an ability called Tao, which is defined as, quote, a dormancy trance a type of bindu suspension in which an adept can slow her physiological activities to a level just on the edge of life maintenance, a trance useful for survival under threatening conditions and also necessary to rejuvenate cells, end quote. 
And, so and the part that cool. sticks out to me there is the rejuvenate cells. Like this is like a, you go into the Bakta tank in Star Wars and you heal yourself yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Other abilities at this second level include something called Prajna, which is a deep meditation trance, and something called Adab, which we've talked about in a previous book club, which is an unconscious recollection of memory. All three of these abilities kind of fall under this broader umbrella of techniques known as prana bindu, which is a word you've probably heard us throw around quite a bit on this podcast. Right. Prana bindu is just the practice of complete mental and physical control that makes the Bene Gesserit so deadly. So to wrap up the morsel, in summary, the Dune Encyclopedia tells us that these prana bindu techniques basically gave the Bene Gesserit superhuman abilities. Quote, Prana Bindu control can heal wounds and retard aging. The Bene Gesserit knew their cellular structure so intimately that they could analyze and neutralize most poisons within their bodies. The great test of this ability occurred during a woman's initiation as a reverend mother in neutralizing the water of life within her system. End quote. Amazing stuff. Amazing abilities. And that's a bit more about that metabolic control. They know their cellular structures and their bodies so much that they can control it down to the point of literally rejuvenating cells and prolonging their lives for God knows how long. <laughs> so cool. So cool. And that's our episode. Oof. So take a breath, take a lap, <laughs> walk around the block or something. I don't know. <laughs> The next episode is going to be a mailbag, as we hey. mentioned at the beginning of the episode. So if you were hesitating to send us your thoughts, your questions, your feelings, do so. Gamjabarpodcast at gmail.com or our Discord mailbag channel. Yeah, totally. And one last reminder that the questions don't have to be all serious. A lot of you send us like deep philosophical stuff that Leo responds to with six pages of text. I can't help it. <laughs> you can, <laughs> he can't help it. Honestly, n neither of us can help it. <laughs> but any and all questions are appreciated. Silly, serious, everything in between. Send it our way, and we will do our best to include as many of them as we can into next episode. Yeah, that, wait, that's actually a great point. Uh, specific request for silly questions, because we have, I think, already a pretty good collection of like serious questions. Yeah. Let's get fucking weird. Let's talk Let's get about weird. It. Yeah. Ask us to explain all the sex objects on gamjabarshop.com. <laughs> we'll do it. How is the tote a sex tote? <laughs> <laughs> oh, buddy. Just We you have wait. drawn you a diagram. <laughs> <laughs> and now we will describe the diagram in intimate detail. Very old, very wrinkly <laughs> in the desert. <laughs> Well, friends, there is no real ending. It's just the place where you stop the recording. But this podcast is always one step beyond logic, so help spread the word of Muad'Dib and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to check out the other shows on the Lord Party Podcast Network on lordparty.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at lore underscore party. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, whoever controls the podcast controls the universe. We'll see you on the golden path. Always so helpful, that so old Duke. Help. Oh, he's great. Plato's like, oh, to have that beard. But no, no, I can't. I mustn't. <laughs> <laughs> the temptation. <laughs> the flickering differences. I, I, I understand the temptation towards Oscar Isaac. I get it. I, oh, I'd give Oscar Isaac control of my body. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime he wants, Oscar, call me. <laughs>